So one tool that geneticists can use to track the inheritance of traits through families is called a pedigree. And it's a diagram of family relationships. It's sort of like a fancy family tree. Um, and we use symbols to represent people and lines to represent genetic relationships. So we can see, again, how different traits, if they're dominant or recessive or sex-linked, are inherited through um, an entire family. So this is the standard notation of a pedigree. If it is a male, it's indicated by a square. A female is indicated by a circle. If the male and female are married, there is a line in between them. And then this would indicate offspring of those individuals, so they have two girls and two boys. If the shape is not colored in, that means that that individual's phenotype is normal for whatever trait we're studying. If the individual has a colored in square or circle, that means that they um, carry or have whatever genetic disorder we are studying. And if we don't know, if we don't have the information to determine if the individual is male or female, but we know that you know there was a brother or a sister, we're just not sure which, we use a diamond. And then we have um, Roman numerals that we use to track the inheritance of the generations from you know the grandparents to the parents to the um, daughters and sons, etc. So we're going to do two examples. Um, this is the first one. This is for Huntington's disease. Huntington's disease is an autosomal dominant trait. And notice that I tell you that we're looking at a pedigree for an autosomal dominant trait. I drew the pedigree on the board over here nice and big so that we can look at it and this way I can write on it as well. You can see with the pedigree, um, I've labeled the generations on the right side here. And you can see at each generation we have at least one individual who is colored in, meaning that they have Huntington's disease, and that's really standard for an autosomal dominant pedigree. You'll see one individual, at least, that has the trait at each generation. So the first question is asking, which members of the family are afflicted with Huntington's disease? So we will say individual one in generation one is affected, in generation two, we have individuals two, three, and seven. And then in individual, in generation three, we have one individual, individual three. So that would be the answer to that question. There are four, five, sorry, total that have Huntington's disease. Okay, the next question. How many children did individuals in generation, individuals one and two in generation one have? Okay, so here, we have individuals one and two in generation one. And then we go down and we look and see how many people do they have connected to them. One, two, three. This is not one of their kids. This is married to their son. Four, five, six. So they have six offspring. That would be the answer to number two. Um, which individuals in generation two have to be heterozygous? Okay, so heterozygous means you have one dominant and one recessive. Um, if we look in, so this is where I'm going to write on it a little bit. What do I know this individual has to have since they are colored in, they have to have a big H for Huntington's disease, right? I don't definitely know what their second letter is yet. This person here does not have Huntington's disease, so they have to be homozygous recessive. So anybody in this entire um, pedigree that is not colored in has to be homozygous recessive since it's an autosomal dominant trait. I also know similarly that all of these individuals that are colored in in generation two have to have a big H. So they got a big H from their dad. What did they have to get from their mom? The only thing that she can give them is a little H. That's the only thing that she can give all of these offspring. And then if we look, some of these sons and daughter are not colored in. That means they're normal. So that means that they also have to be homozygous recessive. And if this couple had children that were homozygous recessive, we can work backwards and figure out that this dad had to be heterozygous as well. That wasn't the question. The question was which individuals in generation two have to be heterozygous. So we would say individual two, three, and seven have to be heterozygous. The last question is asking us 
If individual three in generation three marries a normal man, what is the chance that they will have a child with Huntington's disease? So we know if the, if the man is normal, he has to be homozygous recessive. Even if he has one big H, he's going to have Huntington's disease. We look down here, individual three in generation three has Huntington's disease, okay? And we go back and look, her mom had Huntington's disease, but her dad was normal, so he's homozygous recessive, therefore he had to give her a little H, she got the big H from her mom. So we know what her genotype is, and we said that her husband has to be homozygous recessive. So you can make a Punnett square. And when we cross these individuals, there is a 50% chance that they will have an offspring that has Huntington's disease. So that one you had to do a little bit of extra work to answer that. Let's do another example. Okay. Hitchhiker's thumb is an autosomal recessive trait. So this means that um, an individual is going to have to be homozygous recessive to display this trait. And I made this pedigree on the other side. Okay, So when we look at this pedigree as compared to the first one, you can see that we don't have as many shapes colored in. This is typical of an autosomal recessive inheritance pattern. Okay, it's not until we get to generation four that we even see individuals that have this trait. Um, we have a lot of normal individuals. So the first question is, how many daughters do individuals three and four in generation two have? So generation two, here's individuals three and four, and how many daughters do they have? One daughter. Right, that was pretty easy. What is the sex of individuals of the individuals that one and two in generation three, what's the sex of their offspring? Generation three, individuals one and two, they have one offspring, and that's a square, so that means that they have a son. So they have a male offspring. Next question, what is the relationship between individuals two in generation one, and individual five in generation three. So individual two in generation one, individual five in generation three. So if we work backwards, this would be the mom and dad, and then generation up, this would be her dad's mom, so that would be her grandmother. So you could say that individual two in generation one is the grandmother, or individual three in generation five is the granddaughter. The last one, which individuals in the Punnett square have to be heterozygous for hitchhiker's thumb? So, if we go through, we know that all of these individuals have to have at least one big H, right? Because they're all normal. We don't know what their second allele is, but we know that they display the normal phenotype of not having a hitchhiker's thumb. And there's a lot of them. Until we get to these two down here, which do display hitchhiker's thumb, so we know that they are homozygous recessive. So if these two are homozygous recessive, we can work backwards and say that each parent had to be heterozygous in order to pass the little h on to this son and this daughter. So we know that in generation three, individuals four and five have to be heterozygous. You'll be doing several of these for your homework, so good luck.